Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Boots and Backstraps podcast. Brought to you by Homes by Shane and produced by Danny Geo Productions. Come on now. Honey's on looking for backstraps. Way deep in the woods. Tracking in a swamp to a hay field under the harvest moon. But when the tags are filled, it's time to switch up our boots. Head down to the honky tonk, get us a swing dance or two. We're talking about boots and back straps. Hey everybody, this is a show where we talk all things hunting and country music. From the classics through today. From big bucks to bull elk. We've got it all. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Boots and Backstraps. Uh, I am your host, Shane Michael, and I'm joined in studio by my ever so talented and experienced co-host, Mr. Tom Cat. Come on now. Come on now. How are we doing, sir? I'm doing great. So Fourth this is of July. Yeah, and it's our first episode in the new studio. Yeah, this is great. I'm actually loving it, and I'm serious. It's everything. Uh, the visuals are great for us here. Uh, we used to sit on the furniture, and it was the old furniture, you know. But it looked kind of cool. But you were really slouched down in there, and it was kind of uncomfortable, actually. Everybody looked awkward sitting yeah. on the couch. And and I was like, I this is awkward. not working. <laughs> I love this. We have a brand new table, and. Uh, There's a brand new bottle of uh, bourbon on the table, which I know you will discuss here in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of excited about that. Have you tried yours already? I did. Yeah. You always jump in early. I cheated. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay, man. Uh, I am excited, though, because not only do we have a great guest today, but as we just talked about, we've got a brand new studio set up, and I'm, I'm really happy with how things are coming together in here. Yeah. Looks nice. Yeah. It'll be good for us moving forward. Um you can't really see as much on camera right now because it's just you and I, Tom, but that we do have an extra microphone set up now so we can have bands or duets or whatever that can come in and not just our solo guests. So I'm looking at the monitor. I just realized we chopped off the head of teddy bear back here. <laughs> He's too tall. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to shorten him up or something. Yeah. Take his legs off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's good. So let's, uh, let's roll right into our Whiskey of the Week, because, uh, Tom, I know you alluded to that, yeah. and it is our newfound fi- uh, favorite segment to start the show. And this week's uh, whiskey that we've chosen is Four Roses. Four Roses is a uh, Kentucky bourbon, and uh, it was founded in 1884 is when they actually moved to Kentucky, um, into Louisville, actually. And that's, that's a point of contention right there is the pronunciation of that city. Louisville? Louisville. What are the three things Louisville are famous for? The Hot Brown bourbon yeah and uh i guess i don't know what the third one is what did you say the first one was the hot brown the hot brown hot brown yeah so what would be the second you went from the first to the third oh i was saying in, <laughs> in no particular order well the louisville kentucky uh is famous for muhammad ali okay uh the louisville slugger yes the baseball bat so there's four things then and not in louisville but the kentucky derby obviously yeah and then there are bourbons, so four things. Yeah, I like it. Well, we're talking about the bourbon specifically today. So Four Roses, I mentioned, um, got set up in, in Louisville in 1884, even though they were credited with making bourbon in the 1860s. And their founder, this uh, gentleman named Brent Elliott, um, is an interesting story that I'll share with you as sort of like our little tidbit about the bourbon today. Okay. And uh, Brent Elliott, um, the, the, where the name Four Roses came from is he was really interested in this gal, and they were going to go to a ball. And he sent her this note that said, if you're also interested in me, when you come to the gal, when you come to the ball, wear a rose on your dress, right? Wear a rose. And so then I'll know. she wore four. And she wore a, a, a corsage, I think, corsage with four roses on it. Oh. And so then he named his distillery Four Roses. Cool. Yeah. And then they married and lived happily. Yeah, I don't know if that worked out for him. I I mean, that's cute. You have to assume it did because you know when there's bourbon involved, you never know what the hell's going to happen. That should should be a country song. It should be a country song. Yeah, but it's uh, this the one that we're drinking today is their small batch, and it's fantastic. It's one of my new favorites, and uh, and I know that we're going to enjoy it while we're discussing stuff with our friend who's in studio today. So let's get a clink and drink here to start with my friend, to you, sir, and to you, sir. Jeffrey? Yeah, he's got to get in even though he's not on camera. Clink. Yes, sir. That is really good. I mean, I've had Four Roses before. I actually had it in Louisville at a restaurant called Bourbons there, and they have all the great bourbons. 
And for those of you that are wondering why are you guys drinking on your show, it's like we're not guzzling, uh, we're sipping. And uh, it's not MC Hammer time. Yeah, it's <laughs> and this is America. America. And this is America, and uh, we don't uh, we don't advocate that anybody drinks and drives or abuses alcohol. But boy, it sure is good when you're just taking a little sip. And I, I know uh, all my friends would con- and your friends would concur with that. So, including the one that's in studio today. Yeah, yeah. We, he looks like a drinker. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you should take that personally or not. <laughs> I recognize You can make him. noise, man. It's okay. <laughs> I think he's trying to be quiet. Um, so we will give you a proper intro, though. So we are joined in studio today. I, I should say, Tom, I'm, I'm probably more excited about this episode than any episode that we've had in a while that I can oh, think cool. of. Not only because I've got my good buddy in studio, who I haven't seen in forever, so it's good for us to get to see each other, but also because we're going into a subject that I know you're super passionate about. Right. And uh, so our guest today is here to talk about birds and bird hunting, conservation. Um, He was a guide famously for a long time and then also a well-known local photographer of of birds as well. And so uh, we will welcome into studio for this episode of Boots and Backstraps our good buddy Jeff Bowler. Good. We're really good. I'm going to just bring this in on you a little bit, my friend. You just move this. No, I wouldn't do that on camera. Here we go. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, sir. Welcome. That is, um, you're keeping that. Or... <laughs> it is yummy. Yes, that it is, is. That is warming mm. for the uh, juice belly. Mm. Yeah, especially if you're used to light beer. It's a nice mix so. up. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks for making time to join us today, man. Not a problem. I, uh, how long ago was that you asked me? Uh, it must've been February. We started looking at time to not tell anybody. Yeah. right. (laughs) (laughs) Looking at dates. It was like, ah, well, you know, what does your schedule look like as we get into April and May and right. Well, and that's for me having kids in sports and hockey consuming so much of it, you, you just end up not knowing if you're going to have a random pop-up tournament, especially with all the COVID stuff. Um, yeah. Was, we had uh, four hockey tournaments on the docket, and we only ended up doing one. Okay. Because it, everything got canceled, and it was kind of nice. Got to do some more ice fishing. People are still crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. they still are now, even though most things are open. Right. So, yeah, crazy, crazy times. If you've got kids in high school or grade school or whatever – and they're in sports, man, that can be an all-consuming uh, time in your life. And I've, I know I've, I have a lot of friends that have kids in high school and stuff, and, boy, they, don't, they can't be around for a holiday. I mean, I don't care if it's Easter or Christmas or whatever. They've got tournaments to go to. Yep. And I, I don't know about that. I'm not a big fan of that deal. I'm a big fan of hockey, but, boy, you know, save time for the holidays, you know. Set aside time for the holidays. That would be nice. The yeah. worst ones are when they, oh, where are you guys from? Cottage Grove. Oh, okay. Uh, your tournament and Thanksgiving is War Room. What? Right. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, it's you're lucky if you get a close one near a holiday. War Road's like yeah. four hours, isn't it? Oh, oh War Road seven. is, yeah. From Cottage Grove, it's a good seven hours, yeah. Ooh. You have to, like, fill up your gas tank twice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yep, bring a generator. <laughs> right. You feel like you're driving to Florida. It's like, no, we're still in the same state. <laughs> right, right. That's crazy. You know, I drive from uh, here to uh, Thief River Falls, and that's six hours. And we're north of the Twin Cities. He's south of the Twin Cities. And War Road is where my accountant used to live and uh, had a great piece of property up there. But it's seven hours, easy, to get from Cottage Grove to War Road. It's a long go. You can get to Chicago quicker than you can War Road. It's crazy how that works, yeah. isn't it? And you're still in one state. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. That's oh, amazing. That's oh, absolutely. Wow. Well, gentlemen, let's talk some birds. Come on birds. now. Let's go. Yeah, uh, I think what I want to start with, Jeff, is just talking about how you got into hunting, how that passion grew, and then as we get into that conversation, we can talk more about the evolution and how it started spreading to all these other things you've done with the wildlife industry. So let's talk about where you started, man. I was uh, a friend of mine. His name's Chris Hansen. Um, I met him in high school. Okay. Um, after my folks divorced, you, I went with mom. And you're hooked. <laughs> I'm trying to kill myself. Um, so you're meeting new people, and come to find out that 
he and I had an interest and um, basically staying kind of staying friends with with Chris all the way through high school and then next thing you know he's like hey you want to go hunting because I got my driver's license first so there we go <laughs> very important I got my <laughs> license before he did and I had a car and what have you so, so your hunting capacity went from backyard to <laughs> yeah you could venture out a little oh bit. man I remember when I got my driving license driver's license my hunting went oh my gosh I can go up north I can go up to Mille Lacs, shoot grouse, and duck hunt, and whatever. Right? Okay, Great. big deal. Quick question: yes. What was everyone's first vehicle? Ha! Oh boy, do you remember yours? I do. Okay, what was it? I bought it from my mother. Okay. It was a five hundred dollar Plymouth Sundance. Whoa! Two door, wow. five speed. Oh, it started with a stick. I did. That's good. I did. That thing went through a lot of cornfields and bean fields. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it never got stuck. You, got, you had to part. have a car that could do that. Cornfields, bean fields, mud, up the sides of hills. TK, how about you? What was your first My mobile? My first car was a 57 Chev. Really? Yeah. And You started off pretty schwanky. My second car was a 56 Chev. If you only knew then what you know now. Oh, I know. <laughs> I always say that. Shane? Yeah. Your first car. Oh, I was just letting TK finish. Oh, sorry. Mine was a uh, 1978 Ford Fairmont station wagon. Oh. Perfect. Had the all-steel body on it. Wood paneling. Uh, this one was not wood. It was all silver. Nice. And uh, it was one of those things where you could load about 50 people into it. <laughs> yeah. You know, still had, the gig- it had the dual bench. Yep. And then the back end of it was just monstrously huge. So you huh. could easily fit half a dozen people back there. Plus a keg. A few girls. Cool. Keg of Maybe beer. a keg. Maybe. We won't talk about it. <laughs> I mean, we had a queen-size air mattress in there at one point, and there was still about three feet of room between the air mattress and the tailgate. <laughs> wow. I, had, I think mine was a 98 Geo Metro. Oh. 98 it was the best. Geo Metro. The nice thing about the Geo Metro is if you don't parallel park good, you can just get out and pick it up and just... <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It does, yeah. Virtually. Like 50 miles to the gallon. It's, it's like great. driving a Razor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. Right. Just not as... Peppy. You're right. <laughs> you know, yeah, speaking like, of vehicles, how many I, squirrel is a geo I really <laughs> got into hunting. You know what I bought? I and I had three of them. Uh, the old Toronados. Uh, yes. Front wheel drive. You know they were kind of a boat, but yep. man, them front wheel drive. They went through any cornfield, and I used them for hunting, deer hunting. <laughs> mm-hmm. I took them through the woods. I just never. A vehicle for me was to be abused and uh, used right. for sure. Yeah, for several for several years, my dad's main vehicle uh, was a minivan because there was three of us: myself, my two sisters, and you add it up, there's five. Yeah. Well, you take that minivan down deer hunting. Who cares if fields wet? Right. Just right. go. <laughs> Just go. Yeah. His his drive, sisters maybe. are also well, maybe not so much Chrissy, but Jess for sure is a big country fan. Yes. I know Chrissy probably dabbles a little, but she's more rock, right? Um, I. Th- I would say Chrissy would be more of a, a, a mix of okay. everything. Sure. She doesn't really have her set genre or what have you. It's Yeah. She yeah. just listens to music, and if she likes the song or whatever, she gets to get in. So you, you, you get your license first. Yeah. It expands the hunting capacity quite a bit. Yeah. And um, so we, we went on a, a couple few hunts here and there because he worked, I worked. You had to somehow put gas into that little thing, you know. Where were you hunting to start with? Was it primarily deer? Uh, no. Um, well, let me take that back. My first experience hunting was deer hunting with my dad. Okay. At 12. Okay. And I had an opportunity to shoot, still to this day, the biggest doe I've ever seen in my life. And I stared at it. <laughs> I got my 12, it down in Watson. Down okay. by Lock Apparel. We were talking about yep, Lock yep. earlier. Um, Nerves or distraction? 12-year-old kid going, aw. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty. Yeah, it's food. <laughs> and then I watched it walk off, and then the light bulb came back. And I went, oh, I, well, guess not. <laughs> and from 12 to 18, um, I had never shot at deer. Okay. That whole time span, and like you jinxed yourself. It's almost what it had to have been, because I, I went anyways, went back out there at eighteen, shot my first deer. Okay. By myself. Nobody else with me, and then okay, well here we go, school hard knocks on gutting a deer. (laughs) 
This is pre-YouTube. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess so. Yeah, that was 98. So I was like, well, whatever. Well, I ended up going way too high because I didn't know. Yeah. But I clean it out and I drag it out of the woods and over to the truck and I'm sitting there looking at this thing going, I kind of want to put that on the wall. Well, save a bunch of was money. Was it a buck? Yep. It was a eight point. Oh. Um, I haven't officially had it measured, but I'm going to guess it might go 115. Okay. Nothing huge, but at 18 years old and yeah. first year, respectable. Yeah. So in order to save a few hundred dollars, I got a tattoo of it on my calf instead. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty smart. So, um, yeah, and it's... We'll have to get a picture of that on the break. uh, Dig through my Facebook. I'm sure it's in there. Um, On it. it, Yeah. (laughs) Actually, it's probably in a file of this, that, and tats or something like that. I think I called it. Album, not file. Not the one of his butt, though. We don't need any of that. Okay. I got to take that off the docket. Thank you. Please. (laughs) Um, So you cut it up too high... To do a shoulder mount, correct. But you still kept the horns. And still got the rack, and yeah. and and I have, I have a story on my leg, and th- those that know me know I have a few tattoos, but everything has a story. Yeah, um, and a meaning. Right. So, um, so anyways, fast forward back to or get back to Chris. Um, he introduced me to a guy named Pat. Um, his last name's Reimer, Pat Reimer. Chris was working at, you may remember, the old herder store in St. Yep. Louis Park. Yep, yep. Pat and Chris used to work there. So I meet Pat, and so that was, that was around 97, 98 era, too. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed from there with Chris. Um, his knowledge, Pat's knowledge, their calling ability, their brain with all of it, it's like, this is ridiculously intriguing. What was Pat and Chris's last names? Chris Hansen and Pat Reimer. Chris is actually currently overseas okay. defending our country. Oh, oh well. good for him. Um, yeah, thank you for his service. Late arrival. I think he joined maybe two years ago. Okay. Um, yeah. He's but like he's, your age? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, but he's a, a lot more healthy than <laughs> I would be. And hey, You know what I keep telling everybody? Look, round is a shape. <laughs> I, I got that nailed. Um, but, um, yeah, through the years, you know, you, you build more relationships, you meet more people and same thing with archery or, yeah. you know, you, you go out to, a you know, say you do a guided mm-hmm. hunt out in, in Nevada or something. And next thing you know, this person knows that person and you start talking with that guy and then find out you have mutual friends back here. Yep. You know, so that's, small world. Yeah. So it's, Waterfall for me was the same thing. It turned into all sorts of opportunities, and some of them I will never stop playing in my head. But certainly, that's what it's all about. When you, when all of that really started coming heavy for me, obviously you start buying things. You you go buy a boat. You put a custom blind on it. You you realize right. how expensive the sport is, <laughs> right? But you're not upset about it. No, oh, no, because you pumped. You, yeah, well, couldn't you know those things are going to last for years? Right. Yes. You know, and as mean as this is, uh, shotgun rifle hunting for deer, it's still fun. Yeah. But I have, when I finally archery hunted, I found a new respect for archery hunters and was like, I'm doing that from now on instead. Because it's way harder, right? Right. And it's the same thing, you know, ducks and geese. You got your your group is hunting 200 yards down this way, and you're on a giant public water system or something, and your group's 200 yards down this way. You're 180 yards that way, and birds are swinging you. Well, I'm supposed to give you the respect. Well, if I got birds dumping in on my spread, sorry about your birds, bud. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. but... It's those things you learn through time, and it was Chris and Pat that taught me so much about that, uh, not downwinding a guy. Right, you right. Know? And that transferred into so many other things, but when you can look back and send Chris a message 20 years later, 
hey, remember this hunt? Oh, yeah, and, and Paul fell in when he was trying to go grab a bird and filled his waders, and, you know, just those things, just boom, there they are. And it's, it's going to, it's stuck, and now I'm trying to pass it on to my kids. That's awesome. Well, the hunting uh, lineage and the hunting heritage is nothing like it, you know. So rewarding. Uh, the things that you do learn, like you, like you said, um, just carry on into everyday life. Very much. And uh, the memories are just phenomenal. I mean, that's what this is. All. I've said this in past podcasts. These things on the wall aren't necessarily a trophy. or They're all a memory. They're all a great memory of who I was with, where I was at, and how it happened. And <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that I going to respond to that text message um, later, but because of who it came from, um, it just made my day. Oh, good. So good. Well, being here started it. <laughs> not not going to take away from that, but yeah, no, that's um, cool. Yes, I'm sorry. No, no. You know, I you're a, if I understand correctly, and uh, what I know of you, you're a guide for uh, goose and duck hunting. And my goose and duck hunting career was very limited. I certainly did a fair amount of duck hunting and goose hunting, but my passion was more pheasant hunting and grouse hunting. Mm-hmm. And maybe sharp tails out west, and uh, see that's a whole lot more work than I'm willing to do. That's too much walking. <laughs> see, I yeah, it's a lot of walking, but I, I think what you do is a lot more work. Getting up so early and putting out those spreads of decoys, and sometimes sitting in a boat and maybe even freezing your butt off. Where mm. I prefer getting out in the fields and getting out after them, walking, and I love walking the fields. And Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's certainly each to his own. I'm not criticizing anything, you know. If you're out there doing it, it's cool, you know. Well, and that's that's another thing that I kind of feel bad about. My dad has a giant passion for pheasant, mm-hmm. giant passion for it. And the number of times he's invited me to go out to Watson because his family has a lot of property out that way. Uh huh. You know where Watson is, Tom? Yep. He's uh, got a Ram McNally in his head. Oh yeah, it's crazy. I'm like, what? You know where that is too? <laughs> yeah. Right. I know so and so there and this farm there. And I, I thought like, about <laughs> you. I was talking to a gentleman. Um, I'll think of who it was in a minute, but he was uh, uh, hunting in uh, in Wyoming, uh, and I'm for, now I forgot the name of the town, but it's between Jackson Hole and Lander, Du Bois, hmm. and I have a nephew that lives in. Uh, in Lander, and we started talking about Lander and Du Bois and Jackson Hole, and I thought, well, Shane would laugh right now because I know all the area where this guy yes. was hunting sure. <laughs> and snowmobiling. He's actually the guy that owns uh, Gustav's, I hope I said that correctly, Rock. I just brought a bunch of rock down here. Really cool guy. I'm giving a plug for his business, but I bought like two yards of rock, one type of rock, and two yards of another, t- and I swear the guy gave me four yards and yeah, just a great operation north of the city's uh, north of the north branch here. Gustafson, Gustafson, Gustafson. Same guy as in uh, Grumpy Old Men. Oh, sure, <laughs> perfect. Not the same guy, but the same name. Can we talk about these decoys? Yeah. All the, <laughs> well, you yeah. were bringing up decoys, and I was like, "Hold is on." Is that Savannah and Hunter? That is Savannah and Hunter, and that photo is. That's got to be a decade old. That photo has got to be circa. 2009. Wow. Two, no, wait. Wow. No, because Hunter's way too big. So 2010. Okay. Wow. Because Hunter was born in 2008. So, yeah, it's, that's so 2010. So many decoys. I was like, you just have this many in your yard? And he's like, those are decoys. Oh, Danny, when these goose hunters, <laughs> when they get out in the field, that's just a fraction of what they put out. No way. How oh, many? It's just a fraction. That, they put out hundreds. That right there, the trailer wasn't emptied yet. And that, and. That was probably only four dozen. How many decoys do you have? Now or then? Oh. Then. Then. Peak, more, peak Jeff then, decoy. Then <laughs> more than now. Wow, um, thank you. Jeff. <laughs> I want a ballpark, That was very Jeff. specific, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, I want a ballpark. Right now, I believe my bride and I have somewhere around seven or eight dozen. Seven or eight dozen? Yeah, with more to come. That's pretty. That's yeah. These guys. I, I didn't that, even know. These guys yeah. that go up to North Dakota and up into Canada, they bring truckloads of those decoys, and that's what I was alluding to. I'm not the kind of guy that wants to get up at three o'clock in the morning and spend two hours putting out decoys, and then hunting. You know, that's I, I'm just not an early morning guy unless I'm deer hunting or elk, elk so hunting. So there's you have a photo 
um, from uh, Cottage Girl's Beatdown. Got it. Pile of mallards. Smackdown. That one. So this hunt. Holy moly. I did not shoot all of those, okay. just for clarification. Well, we shot our limit, and it is what it is. But that particular hunt between my decoys and one of the guys that invited me, we had a total of 30 dozen out. 30 <laughs> dozen. <laughs> there you go. That's ridiculous. 30 dozen. <laughs> and you had to have that because there was another group hunting the field across the road. Right. 360. Yeah, I was and, just going to say it's 360. And they, the, the fun part about that type of stuff, you're, you're competing against that guy that's right across the road from you. Yeah. You can see their decoys. You can, our benefit, you can go back to that one real quick, please. Yep. Our benefit is that grass line behind us. Sure. Some prairie grass that helps, up there. That helped break us up. That was, right. that was like an island in the middle of the field. Okay. Mm-hmm. And is it the prime spot to go? Not always, but it gives you a much better hide. But when, from, those are blinds all behind you, right? Those are all growing blinds behind us. Um, corn stocked in. There's stubble straps, so you just grab a handful, put them in. Um, you don't want to make it nothing but corn because when you look down, you still see dirt. So it's right, spotty. Right. It's, it's still got to look decent. But that other group, you might as well have just handed them a blaze orange flag. Were you you were doing it. archery then? No, that's that's all gun. No, that's all gun. Oh, that's all shotgun. Yeah, only yeah. doesn't it scare everybody away when you make a shot though? Only Tim Wells can hunt birds with a bow. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, is that is that? I'd still like to try it. <laughs> no doubt. So Get what do you what do you Wells use a bow for? Uh, thousands of free arrows. Deer. <laughs> oh, oh. You can bow oh. hunt for you can bow hunt for geese. People do it. I'd the love to try it. Wait till they know. land. Oh, I've seen people taking them right out of the air. Mm. Oh, yeah. I'd be... It's amazing. I'd have to find the cheapest arrows in the world because I would miss a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. And never find them again. Yeah, and arrows are not cheap. No, no. not anymore. Not anymore. 12 to 15 bucks an arrow for decent ones. Right. Jeff, I got to tell you, I, my last goose hunt was um, two, maybe three years ago. We went down to Missouri for the... Um, was it spring? Yeah, it was a spring uh, snow goose hunt. And... You know, if anyone knows anything about snow goose, Danny, you can't believe the thousands of decoys they put out for that. And you're laying on the ground in one of those blinds, and you watch literally thousands and thousands and thousands of snow geese all over the place. And typically at that time, you're only the juveniles will come in. Mm-hmm. And I got to tell you, we laid there in that field from sun up to sundown for three or four days, and I think our group shot four geese. The juveniles were yep. uh, had already gone through, no, you didn't and I got to tell you that was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> that is, it, it was just man, you're laying there and you're laying there and you're laying there and you're watching, you're looking up into the sky, and it's cool being out in the country and it's cool being in Missouri, and <sighs> being with the con- the guys that we we're with, and uh, you know Dave Miller was one of them, his son Tom Miller was there, and um. And I can't even believe how much fun it would be if the juveniles were coming through. And, you know, I brought a half a dozen or a dozen boxes of bullets, you know. I mean, shotgun shells. I call them bullets. Um, And I think I only shot like three or maybe four times. And uh, if you miss it, it's not fun. But if you hit it, well, then it's crazy fun, I bet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's – I kind of like to compare – Snow goose hunters to musky anglers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You spend so much money, so much time. Your Their dedication is tenfold of, of us as archers or just regular waterfall hunters or pheasant hunters. Or, you know, the m- amount of money invested in time in that, I, that's hats off. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've, I've never done a snow goose specific hunt. Um, but in Canada, I went in 2008 with a group of guys from Indiana and Illinois. Majority of them were from Indiana and randomly I'm getting invited to go and I said, okay. Yeah. And my ex-wife was about to pop Hunter out at the time and she's like, okay, which floored me. Um, but 
going up. For those of you that aren't familiar with that slang, Pop Hunter out means she was about to give birth to uh, yes. their son <laughs> named Hunter. <laughs> Fair enough, my dad. Fair enough. Um, yeah, there go all the female viewers. <laughs> yeah. They're turning, tuning out. Bye. Um, but, yeah, they did a couple snow goose hunts up there, and one there was one day... I believe they had 1,800 decoys out between Silosox and a couple few full bodies. And, and it, it's, it's a production. I mean, it, it's... 1,800 decoys, Danny. And was this a guy... <laughs> so the, when we went to Missouri, it was a guy to deal. You just yeah, semi to transport that. We, we sure as heck didn't have that many decoys and yeah, the sound can, system. Canada was... Canada. That Canada trip was all self-guided. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. But there, was, there were 13 of us. One guy running a camera full time, so this whole thing was filmed. And someone allegedly has a DVD. I, allegedly, <laughs> I do. Um, I can call my, I'll, I can call the wife and say, "Hey, quick, go put this together and send it to me." But ship it to you. Right. Ship it. Well, she could, she could <laughs> film it with her phone and send it. But that's that's the joke with him, though. Sure, he, ship it. He, Most people send it. I ship it. Email ship. Ship. Ship it. Ship it. Ship it to me. I'm going to start using that. Up. I'm going to keep that one going. There you go. I'm going to confuse a lot of people. I say Thank you. I say it in my real life, too. <laughs> I was golfing with Oscar the other day. He's a guy that we had on as guest, one of the most famous sheep hunters in the world. He said, ship that over to me on my phone, and I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Oscar. He's even older than I am. So. We had him on. Sure. So he was in on the joke. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that one going. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was all self-guided between the the 12 of us that were actually hunting um we figure we never really took accurate numbers but we figured for that week we were up there was over 500 birds whoa there were that you harvested yeah it's it's eight ducks per person okay eight canada geese per person eight snow geese per person well we never chased the snow geese but figure the filmed hunts was usually seven or eight guys they had a limit on the snow geese yeah and what is this a fall hunt yep okay because for your information chain you know most snow geese hunts there are no limits depending on the state yes depending on the states yep. i mean you can they want you know the dnr especially the dnr in canada the snow geese are literally eating the tundra away there's such a they've become so populated that they're a huge nuisance up there mm-hmm. When they congregate in Canada, they're literally eating everything. And from Canada down to uh, Louisiana, they want you to shoot as many mm-hmm. snow geese because you can't shoot enough. It's like coyotes. They'll never put a dent in the population. Right. Or right. wild hogs. They'll never put a dent in the population. Right. So how many do you get to actually bring back? You're, you're allowed one limit to bring home. and it's So eight birds, right? Of each species. Oh, okay. So depending on what the bird is and what the limit is for that specific bird, you're allowed to bring one daily limit home from cross-border. But that was back in 2008. What is it now? I have no idea. Sure. I'd love to go back up and find out. But Well, Danny's got the Google machine in there. We could take a look. Yeah. It's, See what the Canadian Danny's doing goose double limit time today. Yeah. for harvest I mean, is. Yeah, it was nothing for 96 ducks a day. Jeez. And I mean, I can't imagine the amount of ammunition you're going through. Enough. A lot. <laughs> you're allowed just one, enough. <laughs> you're, you're allowed one case. If you bring you're f- free, if you bring more than that, you have to declare it and you pay a charge on that. So how many rounds are in one case then? Ten boxes. Twenty five. Ten shows boxes. Box. Twenty five. Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty rounds. Quick, I almost quick went Oklahoma a mass. Case. I almost went through a case. <laughs> That's it's, awesome. <laughs> it was, I, yeah, it sucked because I actually did wear out the gas piston in my shotgun that. Huh. Trying to keep up with when yeah, they're flying Pearls away. get hot. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. Things get hot, and you're dumping rem oil or spraying something in there to try and keep things moving. Yeah. You end up with failures, and it happens. Wow. I mean, you know, but, yeah, that was that was a trip of a lifetime, and, and the plan is to try and get my wife and all the kids up there to experience that, too. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's kind of actually scary that I have my wife – my my new my now wife Amanda Amanda yep we can say Amanda give Amanda a shout out absolutely now that I have her Mrs Bowler mentally physically everything invested in waterfall she wanted to try it. 
All right, let's try it. Well, for an example of how hard this got into her system and her desire, I took a nap one day. I don't remember what I was doing prior to that, but I... I Cut the grass or something husband-like. <laughs> or just sitting there, whatever it was. Um, that can be tiring too, I, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I fell asleep and I woke up to my bride pulling in the driveway and doors closing and like, I don't know. I don't know where they went, but whatever. Oh, you're I probably thinking, up. I hope she went to get tacos. <laughs> no, I, that's it, what I would have thought. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think we already had dinner planned, but that don't matter. Okay. All right. All right sorry. I get out, I get outside and she looks at me. She says, I love you. I said, Oh, oh boy, I love you too. And then she opens the back hatch of the Durango and it's stuffed with decoys. <laughs> I go take a nap and she comes home with two. Dozen she found decoys. a sale. She did. <laughs> well, good on her, I guess. And it was, I don't think we will ever come across. Here's your wife. There she is with a beautiful redhead that she shot. That was her first diver two years ago. Wow. Oh, down, oh, down by, we were down by Treasure Island Casino on the, on the lake behind it. That's a beautiful bird, though. You know, Danny, on the topic of duck hunting, I have a photo of a gal in my phone when I was down in Caledonia a few years ago hosting a uh, Quail Forever banquet. There was these girls from the very tip, I think it's Brownsville, uh, Minnesota, Browns Valley maybe. The very Down by t- Bluers? S- no, the very southeast corner of uh, Minnesota. Anyway, there's this family of girls, and they're all duck hunters. And she showed me a picture, and it just uh, we'll show it on the screen here after the break. I just thought of it now. It is the coolest photo of her and her dog hunkering down watching ducks flying. And uh, it was featured in uh, some duck, uh, maybe Duck Hunter, Ducks Unlimited magazine. It was actually a cover photo. And uh, we'll show that on the screen here. It's just now that we're talking about duck hunting, I don't have much for photos, but I do have that one. And it is such a cool photo. Yeah, You'll, uh, you'll really relate to it. There's uh, one of the, the photos that, they, you guys, that you guys put on uh, Facebook um, is of the sunrise. Yes. I'm looking for it right now. That. Um, we had, uh, been fortunate enough to borrow a friend of mine's boat, um, and used it that whole entire season, her first waterfall season. And it's just one of those mornings, everything's feeling great. The weather's perfect. It's not too cold. It's not warm. There's a nice breeze. You're going to be comfortable. And I'm sitting there. Here we go, Jeff. I'm sitting there. I look up. That is a cool photo. There's zero editing. On that photo, that is straight. That's a raw shot. Straight out. Of That's the straight. Jesus painted that. Yep. You took that picture. Yeah. Got wow. It. That My. Is. That there's there's no comparison. Whether it's a deer stand, a turkey blind, waterfall out in a field, walk. You know, Minnesota at nine a.m. start for pheasants. Well, you can go some, right. some public places. You have to get there in order to be able to get on the field. Right. Right. Because of the number of people. That those are. Those are paintings that you can never yeah. get back. I would get that in a giant print for the wall. Amazing. That's gorgeous. There's, there's you know, it doesn't matter if you're totally not a duck hunter, but you are a hunter. I mean, we have such appreciation for each other's sports. Anyone that doesn't hunt ducks would st- truly appreciate that photo. Absolutely. That and that's, Those are all decoys, right? I, Those are all decoys. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What? Go back. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, oh, you know what's, come on. One of the funnest things about this podcast is uh, watching the education that Danny's getting. And <laughs> Aren't you proud of her, though? Conservation mm. and uh, she's learning all the so things much. that she's learning. I that's, thought they were real. I was like, that's, wow. That's, that's not even a dent of what we have for water decoys. Oh, my God. <laughs> but it, There's I mean, different it is, kinds? Oh, yeah. Oh. The big ones, are, big ones in there are goose decoys. The smaller ones are duck decoys. Okay, we're going to go shopping together. Okay? Can you see the difference, Danny? No. Like, you can tell just by the length of the neck. It's like you look on the far right side. I was wondering what this like one The third one in guy. from the left. That is, is a spinning wing decoy. Yeah, and then keep, like, keep going two more left. Beep, beep. That's a goose. Okay. And then you get some of the ones that have the shorter necks. As you get more to the left side of the photo, those are, those are ducks. Okay. Longer neck is geese. Shorter neck is duck. Like, on the far right left, here. that's a duck. a duck. All the way on the far left. Duck. Duck? Yep. duck? That one's a duck. It looks like a loon. <laughs> duck, duck, gray duck. That's right. You can't hunt loons, Danny. No. No. But that's, Protected. 
It and looks that's, like a loon. That's another passion that I had as well. Hunting the loons. Photography. I was just going to say, <laughs> is this what started it? No. Okay, because no. that, that would push me for sure. No, I'm, I'm sure I have photos from back when I first got into hunting that obviously we wouldn't have iPhones and all of that. It was film. I really like this one, too. That's a you good know. one, too, Jeff. Well, that's a great that's segue into uh, your the, other the passion. The foreground yep, that's leading into the background. The photo that you had up with my bride and I and the, and the ducks hanging on the barbed wire. Is that a goose that's, coming in for a landing there? Or a duck, maybe? The little black specks up in there? No, right just in the, in the, the right in the center of the picture. It looks like wings extended. Nope, spinning wing decoy. Oh, that's, that's a decoy. That's a Another decoy. Too. Got me, too. <laughs> um, that, that is where we hunted with the birds that were in the, the barbed wire fence hanging in the barbed wire. Oh, okay. And that particular day, the guy that had has permission for that field is a friend of mine named Garen. He has permission for that field. He shot a double-banded Drake Mallard. The, had the the normal band normal band on one leg and a sixty five dollar reward band on the other, so it was double banded. Can you b- hold on before we get into the photography because I don't want to I want to go there. Yep. But can you just explain this? What we uh, let me back up because Tom catches me with this too. What we try to do is you try to like provide a little education yep. with this also. Absolutely. Because a lot of people that watch maybe don't have any experience in hunting or maybe aren't even a country music fans when we get into music, but. Yep. If you can explain what the band scenario is. So, Sorry, the, is this the one you were talking about? Yes. Okay. That's, that photo was for was that hunt. Also his blushing bride there. That's right. So basically what they do is when they do a banding project, they we'll, will we'll just get to where the camera can see it. There. They will put, where are we? This guy. There you go. They'll yep. put, uh, it's aluminum. They'll put these on. Dunk, dunk. Good luck. <laughs> Maybe it's a good luck dunk. Um, they'll put these on. Um, one leg and they'll be able to, when they put those on they'll guess the age of the bird okay. whether, um, here we go here's a that was one volley for three of us okay that's quite a few all all five birds that fell had a band wow yeah, that was fun um, so obviously not all birds have the bands correct um, they do when they do banding projects um, they're basically it's it's like putting a collar on a bear. Or They're a recording on a... where the bird was banded, how old the bird was. Sex. You know, the sex all, and all that. You know, and where it was banded. It's so like, like sex as in male, male or female. female or if yep. it's having sex? Male or female. <laughs> I mean, they might be. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, um, and then, can you tell with that with the band? <laughs> yes. Actually, you can. Because when you shoot a bird with a band, yeah. you call the phone number that's on here. Sure. It's a... Uh, you report where you shot it, or you can do it on your phone now, like right there in the field. Of course you can. And are and instantaneously know where the bird was banded, how long ago it was banded, and everything. So now they track, okay, we banded it in Thief River Falls in 2013. And then you shot it last year in Missouri, right? That's so awesome. all those years... Where has it been traveling? How many? In over all the years, has it they survived? started. They started banding those, I think, in the fifties. It's been a long time. I and, that one, I'm not sure of. You know, they c- continue to collect all of that data, so it gives them information mm-hmm. as to how many and the flight patterns and the, all the data that the DNR uses to uh, keep tabs on the ducks and the geese. If I remember correctly, and maybe she can correct me on this. If I remember correctly, the oldest. Band oldest banded goose I ever shot was either it was somewhere between twenty five years old and twenty nine. Wow. Okay. So it gives you an idea of how long these birds can live. Right. Right. If they're lucky. If they don't come across and smart guys or coyotes that get them when they're nesting or you know what have you, nature of the beast. Can I ask you what's the greatest distance that you've had with one that you've recovered a band for? When you pull up the data, like the furthest away. And did, and do they even share the data with you? Yes. Yep. Okay. You get a. You get a. Uh, I wonder if I have a picture. Yeah. Yeah. See if you get a picture. Um. Then we could have. Danny. They give you a certificate. Wait, you're Apple person. Yeah. You could do that whole airdrop thing to her. Ship. It I didn't even know that. Was, yeah, you ship it to her. I didn't know it was a thing until ship. Danny said it. Um, but they. Of course, I don't. Yeah, it's whatever. Um, 
But yeah, you get a little certificate that says where it was banded, date it was banded, what male or female, rough age, um, and then it on there it has your name and where you shot it and the date. Um, but I think this band was from a is, was from a bluebill, a duck. Um, and if I remember right, I think this one was banded in Missouri. Wow. But I, I, that's why I was trying to find this. And you shot at Minnesota? Yes. Okay. Red Wing. Okay. That's Stare, quite a travel. Staring, staring, staring at Treasure Island Casino across, <laughs> across the lake. Giddy up. A lot of ducks down there. <laughs> I don't well, know a lot of fluttered a specifically, area. Um, but I found like 19 years old, 17, and then it goes more and more. But this is from, yeah, this isn't quite updated, but yeah. Yeah, and okay, occasionally you can find them on a shore. Like you, mm. if you're walking a shoreline, you'll find a leg, and there's a band on it. Still. Almost like a predator got the bird. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, it's, Shane, it's I don't crazy. know if you want to get into the photography or is conservation. Why don't you choose? Well, well, I think we're already kind of moving to photography. Okay. So let's so just go that direction. If you wanted to see a reward band, that one's a hundred dollar reward band. <laughs> you get paid? Not all of them. Oh. Some of them they put a reward band on. So why do they put the reward band on there? It forces you to report the other band. Oh, because it's, it's, it's this and the other band. Yep. So if you call in a reward band, they're going to ask for that one too. Okay. So this is your this this is your incent their incentive to really get people to actually do their mm-hmm. part, which is the conservation side of right, it. Right. Right. Figure out how old these birds are, how old these birds are, how far they're making it, where their travels might be. And is there a a system that they use for which ones they're rewarding, or is it just X amount, like one every hundred or something? I I think it's just random when it comes to the rewards. But there's what I do know is when the guys do the banding projects and they basically put out a big giant line of feed, birds come in and they're mowing away at it, and off in the distance they have a net that they can remote trigger, shoots over the birds basically holds them there it doesn't hurt them it's not super heavy or so they whatever transport turkeys yep transplant so, and then turkeys. they they basically funnel them into a pen after that and then they do all these but i my understanding is when they do these reward bands they will not disclose where those are done is that duck and geese yes okay yep yep and they there's guys that chase bands they know where the banding projects are and then all they do is care about filling their lanyard with these things. Yeah. And I've seen them. I've seen lanyards, well, especially at the game fair. Yes. You see lanyards that are just Chalk like dozens of them. Mm-hmm. Yep. All of these were public waters, never once chased a banding project, and I don't plan to. How did you go from, I mean, obviously you have this buddy of yours, and he introduced you to, to some other people, and you get real passionate about the hunting. Yep. You have some opportunities to do some super cool hunts, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. Um, so then how does that go into all of a sudden you start having this appreciation for the imagery? Um, I think a lot of that started um, not long before I got divorced. Okay. Um, the kids. Sure. The, your phone can only do so much. Right. And then you understand – you meet people back or, then. <laughs> yeah, you go to a wedding and you're watching a photographer do their thing, and you're like, "Well, that's kind of cool." You know, they you are capturing that couple's big day. Yeah. So it kind of got intrigued. Did they have cameras when you guys got married? They were like <laughs> <laughs> the hand crank and the Poof. the light bulb, yeah. Smoke. Yeah. <laughs> the light bulb that blows up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's as long as she's going to be editing, kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, the, it kind of started with the kids, you know, and, and then, the, you know, being going to going to a wedding and then realizing you see somebody's wedding photos later and you're like, there's no way that photo truly looked like that. They had to have manipulated it somehow, mm-hmm. but how right. I'm kind of intrigued. Sure. Mm-hmm. And then it's, it kind of snowballed from that. I would go, um, living in Cottage Grove, there's plenty of fields. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of, of river, plenty of anything to take pictures of. And I I think I just... I Five kinda, seconds from the St. Croix. Right. And I think I kind of started as far as scenery stuff. I think the first one I ever did was 
um, was a sunset. I found a, a random gravel road, and I just turned around and went, oh, this looks kind of cool. I had a tripod, put my camera on it, and hit the button. And then I must have done that 35 times. And every time I'm looking at the screen, I'm going, why is it blurry? What, what happened? So I'm looking at it, click, and I let go and go, oh, camera's shaking. So then you do the remote. Oh, yeah. So now you can fire it from the remote. So you don't have that shake. And then I also realized you get yourself a better tripod, the tripod don't shake. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, in that essence, sometimes it's the get you, you get what you pay for. Yeah. You know, and then, all right, well, maybe it'd be pretty cool if I could find a different lens. And then, if I mean, you find a different lens, and, and, and then now you're finding a different camera body. And then you realize this is really expensive. And I should maybe try and do something to recoup this stuff. Right. <laughs> Utilizing what my purchase is. Yeah, it can't be a hobby anymore at that point. No. Turn it into I've, a profession. I've got a couple buddies that have 30, 40, 50 grand into photography stuff, and oh, all they shit. do is scenery. Jamie Goff, he's one of the I've I've met him two three times. He's out of he live well now I think he's in uh, Arizona or North Dakota. He was in Egan, um, but I randomly heard of him because he was selling a pair of wild tickets. Okay, and he had him on a local Facebook page, whatever, and and I yeah I'm interested. Like you, there was no arguing with the price and where his seats were. So I'm okay. yes I'm, I want him you know. Um, but when I start talking with them, you get that little icon up in the corner of a profile picture. And you're staring, I'm staring at it going, God, that looks kind of cool. So I finally opened up his profile and then I went thumbing through the pictures. Oh my God. The landscape, the whatever you want to call it. Clearly he's got some talent, right? Oh, big time. But a lot of that is because he's got big money into his equipment. Makes it easier. Yeah, he's got suitcases for lenses. You know, and it's like it's, those guys with those like. Ten thousand dollar scopes on their rifle. Well, yeah. yeah, you can shoot four hundred yards and shoot the flea off the back of a dog. Right, <laughs> right. That's t- above my pay grade. <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it kind of snowballed into that, and kind of dinking around with the scenery thing. And then I, I, uh, I don't even remember where I found it, but I, I think you might remember the photo contest that I did, two thousand twelve ish. Yeah. Um, and. Thanks to everybody from the RCS and, yeah. and family and and other friends voting for me, I, I won the uh, contest a guy did twice with a waterfall scenery photo. We we had a uh, have had this Rowdy Cowboy Show Facebook fan page, right, right, and it's got a bazillion people on it. Mm-hmm. And so when he entered the contest, we were just reposting to that page all the time, like, "Hey, you got to go and vote for Jeff, vote for Jeff, vote for Jeff," and you know, yeah, and winning. It, so it worked out, and I got a really both times I got really cool photo from that guy that put the contest on. Um, and, you know, kind of start thinking, you know, I might, maybe I am doing something with this. And then... Might be on to something. <laughs> and then the phone rings. Got a question for you. How would you like to be the photographer for the RCS? For those of you that Sounds don't great. know what RCS is, it's the right. Rowdy Cowboy Show. Yes. My bad. No. Okay. Well, my wife totally is a fun. school teacher, and she's using acronyms all the time. So we've said I, it on a, on this podcast a bunch. So yeah, I don't know what the hell she's talking about. <laughs> it happens. That happens. Stop <laughs> using big words. Right. Which you know that turned into opportunities. Um, a couple weddings through you um, that you had reached out. You know they're looking for a what photographer. And okay, I can do that. First one, you're trying to take pictures and your hands doing this and because you just don't know not a bad day where here's here. a shoot that you did yeah there's a should be a slightly familiar face right dead center of that photo Dilia, right yeah. Here. Oh, yeah yeah she's she is um probably enjoying a few adult beverages at the moment up at her cabin oh man 2012. and it is <laughs> where is that bridge that was um I believe down by Minnehaha Falls area somewhere. Okay. So this is and on the lower left is Britt. Directly behind her is B, and then to B's left, moving to the right side of the, of the photo is um, uh, Bree, and then Katie, and Allison, and of course you mentioned Jill. Mm-hmm. 
and then Brooke to her side there, and uh, Amber on the far right. I am so impressed. There's a little Shane. Se- there's a little segregation there. I don't know what's going on with the colors. It just kind of goes brown to blonde. <laughs> yeah, I don't, that I, it just worked out that way. That was where they put themselves. Oh, and I'm like, well, you guys are comfortable. You're all right with that. Yep. Okay, you sounds great. But there was um, the other one uh, set of shots um, that was. Um, there's a four wheeler involved. Oh, Here's okay. the same group. Yep. Four wheeler. Okay. It'd be a different. There's almost a completely different set of of ladies. But I mean that it's through those photos I can see my progression through weddings. That I've was done. A, those are great shots, by the way. I mean clearly, when your subject matter is easier to work with, but there's still all this other thing as far as what you're capturing in the photo as a whole. Right. Because I've seen amateur photographers that claim to be wedding photographers or claim to be this or that, and you see some of these shots and you're like, ooh, like how did you not pull that off given what you had to work with? Like even sunsets. Right. Some just bad sunset right. pictures. Like, ah, like if I take one, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> uh, I, they aren't always great for me either. That's why, like, if you, if you, if you pay it, it well, okay, that sounded mean. But if you pay attention <laughs> to <laughs> cameras, they have a shutter count. Okay. They have a click count. Some of these guys that may post 30, 40, call it 100 photos a year, right? So, those hundred photos that they are super proud of, how many thousands of clicks right, right. times did that shutter move to get to that? Mm. When I sold when I sold my Who's the little dude? Oh, <laughs> who was that? That's Shane when he was a little younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't remember who's I think it was I wanna say it was somebody's brother. Yeah, I would say that's not because none of those at that time none of them had kids. Now, um, Jill and Britt, who are the two on the right, both have kids, and I don't think any of the other girls have kids. I do not remember. But, yeah, you can – when I when uh, my uh, – the last camera that I had when I sold that, I had the camera itself for two years, and it was over 30,000 clicks. <laughs> wow. You know, it's crazy to me when you see some of these, like – sporting events and stuff and they just push the button once and you hear it go off like a hundred times yeah right, right. it's like holy moly i can't even imagine the amount of time you'd spend in front of your computer going through and like okay right. not this one not this one not this one you know 30 pictures and you're like well, okay yeah that one. Oh yeah yeah it's and i was um even some of those shoots it was all right i'm i'm just gonna do a, a three or three to five shot blast sure per thing because someone's hair might blow across their face Right. And next one, it's somebody else's. Or a blink, right? Or That's blink probably pretty or common. Blinks all day. <laughs> all day. And that's the bonus of having that many photos. You know, you can notice little, pick out little tiny things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, or getting down to the nitty gritty and wh- whoever you're taking a photo is, isn't, hap- isn't happy with a mole they have. It, it, can you take that out? Sure. Click, gone. So I have to say, Jeff, not to like um, derail the conversation, but your your photography aside, which has always been good. Actually, I remember a conversation you and I had about how you were removing a garbage can from a shot that you took, Mm -hmm. a park scene or something. You're like, Mm -hmm. hey, man, I'm working on getting a garbage can out of this picture. It's pretty cool. (laughs) But uh, I love your wildlife specific photography because that's not like you've got models and they're like standing and all you have to worry about, like you said, is maybe a blink or their hair moving. Right. These are wild animals out in nature, and you're getting some amazing shots with that stuff. Yeah, that's luck. <laughs> there's no, there's no pat on the back stuff. That's it's just, right place, right time though. There is some pat on the back for that. We, yeah, way less than luck. <laughs> way less than <laughs> okay. luck. So, Fair have enough. you ever gone up to the place up in Sandstone to take photos of wild animals? Do you know what I'm no. talking about? No. There's a place, and it's a ra- rather famous place. It's that's actually where T-Way, Troy Gentry, and I were bear hunting, and there was a little controversy up there, and I'm trying to think of the name of the place. Uh, but they had hundreds of animals, rip from skunks, raccoons, coyotes, wolf, bears, in pens. And they were like kind of their pets, but they'd let them run. Yep. And the photographers had come from all over the world, and they'd shoot photos of these animals, and they lived right on a tributary to the St. Croix and 
uh, big boulders in the water, so it looked like they were out west, and the animals would be running or posing on rocks. And then at the end of the day, I asked the guy, I said, well, how do you get all those animals back? Oh, they come back for dinner. <laughs> they, they've got that figured out. They do. They, <laughs> r- they run around crazy. Uh, hey, Jim, the sun's at this spot. We something like go. Wildlife right? Unlimited, but that's <laughs> right? not exactly. the name. But uh, they were kind of a controversial operation, and uh, I think they're still around. Really cool setup. A lot of land. Yeah, there's. A, I got. Well, I got a lot of wildlife bird stuff. Yeah, can we run through some of that, Danny? Barren. Let's just run through some of his um, wildlife photography here on the screen. I don't know how many I sent, but otherwise, I'm a, my I'm photography page. I'm all on the Facebook. So oh, oh give, okay. Give me a minute. Sure. Photography page or the personal one? Photography page. Oh, okay. Because there's more there than on my own page. <laughs> sure. It's just a better spot for it. But yeah, no, it's. A lot of what I was, what I w- had done would be down in Hudson on the Saint Croix, okay. winter time when everything is congregated into one spot. You get trumpeter swans, ducks, geese, the random eagle. You know, just I c- you can you can look, and I'm sure she's seeing it firsthand, the beginning, with the first few ducks and geese photos and and eagle photos, and you're looking at it going, <laughs> what was that? And then you get progression, and you see somebody, their progression of getting better and better and better. Leveling up, yeah. Yeah, same thing with first-time guys trying to shoot a bow. Yeah. You know, hey, bud, that's a 40-inch target. I finally found the four-wheelers. There you go. There's a couple that are they're in a doorway. So it's Liz Barrett on the far right, and then Cass Maloney, and that's Britt Tallman in the middle. And Jesse Clay's, and then I don't know who that blonde is. It's on the far left. I don't even know if I ever met that one. Uh, I, she looks vaguely familiar, but I. I'm drawing a blank. I don't think I met her because usually my memory is pretty good. That is true. So if you I don't remember the garbage can conversation, I did. <laughs> I I tell my wife all the time, who actually is sitting on the other side of the cameras at the moment. Hey, well, Tom's wife gets a mention at least once an episode, so I'll mention <laughs> mine. That looks like Jill there. No, that's Britt Tallman. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> weird. <laughs> that, um, yeah, that, I don't remember whose place that was that we had, were able to utilize for those photos, but that was, that was a blast. You know, but back to the waterfall stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm always more impressed with your shots. I know you're talking about the progression and how you got better, but where you're getting them in mid-flight, that's so cool. Yeah, that's that's the that's the ten, fifteen, twenty shot burst to get the right one. And you just look and pick one. Almost. Like, well, is well a head's hiding in that one. There's a head. Cool. There's a little bit more of its head. Better. <laughs> you know. There's I have a couple I think I have one on there where um it's a it's a goose landing and both wings are completely forward because it's trying to stop itself yeah and you can't see its head because there it's behind its wings wow so it looks like a headless goose just danny we have any luck on the old facebook there still working on it okay um yeah it when it comes to wildlife that's that's some tom trickery patience lots of clicks you know you get lucky on that one that's that one's way more luck than it is would be with people well, we're going to have to take a break here in a minute, gentlemen, um, so we can give some credit to sponsors, keep the lights on, that whole thing. But before we do that, Jeff, will you just give us a demo on the calls that you brought? Because we are going to shift the conversation when we come back and get into more of the country music side of our show. It might not be a bad idea for me to go over there because it's not quiet. It's yeah. really loud. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Right. We'll get you off camera. And um, if you want to just tell us what is what, and then Tom will maybe do a play-by-play for which call you're using. You can do that. How many uh, calls have you got? 700 well i've only got i've only got three with me okay um but i think i only have six or seven okay i'm gonna do a goose and a mallard goose and a duck okay yeah um i'm not the greatest but Ah, the the best no 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 the best the only the only thing that can ever uh, ever beat a person is obviously live bird Right, right. But there are competition callers out there that can do some amazing things on a duck call and a goose call that I am not capable of. I just know that I, what I do, I and I kill birds. That's yeah. what matters. Birds are. Well, the let me ask you a question, Jeff. Uh, with turkey hunting, 
you know, we call turkeys like we call ducks, mm -hmm. but no two turkeys sound exactly alike. I mean, they're real similar. So as long as you're out there and you're making noises, sometimes you can make a terrible call and the turkeys will still come in. Is that the same with ducks or do they have to be pretty convinced? Early in the season, you can get away with squeals, okay. mistakes, lockups. Um, basically, too much air, the call locks up, and you get, a, you get a squeal, and then it locks up, and then you go, oh, bye. <laughs> you know, um, late, late, in the year, late in the year, it's, it goes from you really don't need to call much beginning of the season, and as you progress, you need, you know, then you, some guys will, that's all they'll do is they'll just call, 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 and you just blow them out. Now the birds are getting used to the calls again, so now you don't even have these things on your neck half the time in the late season. Really? Yeah, there's there's days that they don't want to hear a thing. Yeah. Hmm. And you're just sitting there going. Kind of oh, like elk. I got this thing, and <laughs> I really want to use it, but the last time I did, they flared and they left. I might as well just take it off. And it's kind of like when you're out fishing here fishy fishy we haven't caught anything for a couple hours so you start singing a here fishy song or something and ding there's a fish wait you've been fishing with my mom how do you know that uh, i thought everybody knew that <laughs> we well, all I, I thought it was a mom thing i don't know if jeff has to get up maybe if he spun his microphone in the other direction and you called towards that corner sure i yeah. can turn him down too yeah and danny can adjust it i hate to see you go off camera Sure. So, first one, uh, it's a goose call that my wife had custom made for me. All right, we're going to do a goose custom made goose call. It's beautiful. It's I love that grain on there. Every single one of Mike Selzner's calls have something to do with the Lord. Yeah, nice. Everything is named something prophet, apostle, Jeff Spider, Grail. His new goose call is that's out of tin. His new one out is a tin, and it's playing the Grail and Apostle, Justifier. Um, everything has something to do with the Lord. He's very, he's very particular on that. But he's like you and I. He's. I'm probably gonna say the wrong words because I'm <laughs> not. Uh, no one's gonna be offended. You're fine. Um, He's, he's, he, he follows it very heavily. So but do he's we. also you and I yeah. that will cuss like a sailor and, you know, what have you and do things. Let his hair down occasionally. Right. So it, it, makes, it makes him the full Monty, you know, and, and plus he makes amazing, an amazing product. So it's, it's kind of fun, um, but the fact that it's a custom-made call, you know, she, I want that. And can you put his name on it? That's amazing. Right. That's an incredible gift. Was it anniversary or birthday or something? Yeah. Birth anniversary. <laughs> Nailed it. We'll go with that cuz that's that's a whole lot better. All right. I get too many I get too many sentimental things sent in. And That's cuz she loves you, Jeff. And you. <laughs> but somebody would. But somebody would. Except hey, fire except away the love. There, pal. Except the that love. I will call. tell you, brother, second try is the charm. Right, it is. For <laughs> sure it yeah, is. We're, we're both in the same boat. Now. We are, <laughs> without question. Jeff, why don't you aim that to the corner the there? Corner. Aim to the corner so you guys are hurt. <laughs> Baby in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. That was incredible. Sounds like an afternoon at the game fair. <laughs> that would be a game oh, fair. man. That you hear that fair. all day. Yeah, there's a photo that you guys, that she has um, of when I was staffing for the guy who makes this fucking goose call that I am no longer remotely affiliated with. Okay. Um, and it's... We won't mention any Well, names. that was good goose calling. It really was. I mean, that, I... That one's this... I am going to be ordering more of mm -hmm. his calls, but I just need to figure out which one. But he does a lot of custom stuff. Preacher is another one. Okay. Um, 
but yeah, he's he makes us stronger. Yep, game fair. There you go. You were looking There's for the game, game fair. <laughs> well, I work with Outdoor News, and I do the, the game fairs and the state fairs and the sports shows. Not last year because of COVID. Right. But I in, in the booth there, I hear the goose calling all day long. It resonates from one end to the oh, other. Oh yeah, yeah, it does. Especially, yep. especially when they got the calling contest. Going, yep. Because yep. everything is tenfold louder. Well, you're trying to call these birds in from hundreds and hundreds of yards away. Yep. So it's got to carry. It's not like a grunt tube where you're sitting in a deer stand and you want it to go 50 feet. Give yeah. us your best mallard uh, call, Joe. <coughs> or duck. Huh? Is that closer? Oh, no, you're good. This I have had. This call I've had for probably since 2006. It's cool. Again. It's it's made by Buck Gardner. It's called a reactor. He does not make this call anymore. It's a double reed duck call. Um, all of the little cracking that's in there was they flame polish acrylic. So okay. they have a little mini torch that they can go right through the the barrel, come back out, and it flame polishes the acrylic. That's pretty cool. They got it too hot, so that's why it, it did all of this random cracking in it, and. My wife found one of these on the interwebs last year. It sounds nothing like this call. Really? I don't know if that has something to do with it or if I tuned it just right, but it's it sounds way better, but better than this. All right, Justin, yes. give Even us a if look. I'm the one using it, it's like, ooh. Mallards yes. at 2 o'clock. <laughs> right. Get the gun out. <laughs> Very impressive. I'm actually starting to realize that I need to pick these up more often because I ran out of air. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, it, I can just go. Yeah, very impressive, my friend. Very Goose impressive. Goose way different. That's too Well, much if you're better. running out of air, that means Shane would be a great duck caller. Ah, <laughs> yes. Well played. Well played. He's getting one back for, like, all of my shots. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we do need to take a break um, so we can, as I said, promote the sponsors, keep the lights on, all that stuff. But when we come back, folks, from our break, we'll have more with Jeff. We're going to talk a little bit about um, country music, the local country music scene, Jeff's involvement, all of that. A, a very specific famous nightclub. But we will start with coming back from the break. Tom, we've got a little uh, Tom's Tidbits, another new segment that we're mixing in. And so we'll be uh, bringing that right after the break. We'll see you in a minute. Boots and Backstraps is proudly brought to you by Homes by Shane. Making your move with the Homes by Shane team means an unparalleled customer service experience. That level of service is the foundation of this REMAX results referral-based business. Our driven team of experts communicate with their clients every step of the way, ensuring a memorable experience from the first conversation through your closing day. Go to homesbyshane.com for more information. Let's get you home. If you would like to sponsor the Boots and Backstraps podcast or you have an interest in joining our team, send us an email to bootsandbackstrapspodcast at gmail.com. Folks, welcome back to Boots and Backstraps. We still have our buddy Jeff Bowler in studio. He's our expert in uh, birds and more specifically waterfowl. So if you caught the first half of the episode, Tom, you can help me out here. We talked a lot about hunting and uh decoy decoy the decoys you spent a bunch of time on yeah. so many decoys i got some in the back of my truck if you want to see one in person so our decoys i might, I might. our decoys like gremlins like you get them wet and then they just <laughs> there's like a hundred of them now that would be fantastic because then i would actually want to hunt in the rain <laughs> <laughs> yes. but no you have a thousand decoys what happened that well, was raining <laughs> yeah and, and with archery 
as well, the evolution. Yeah. From a long bow to compound bows that are over 340, I think. What are they, 350 now? A feet per second? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, three, I, 350 is uh, pretty typical. I think, it's I moving. think mine might be 330. So you're only talking, you know, last week with evolution. Yeah. You well, know. 330 is still really fast. Yeah. I. Yeah. You're not getting any trouble with a passer on a deer with that. I can remember no. when speed was all the thing, but they've really backed off on that concept that you don't really need, you need this the modern technology. Especially you the broadheads are like. <laughs> the kinetic energy and uh, the, the bows are so accurate these days. Yep. Yeah. Well, and at the evolution with decoys, go back to the market hunter days, mm -hmm. guys were cutting tires in half, and that was a decoy. Yeah. It, That's amazing. Um, it, and there's guys that still do that. And still kill a bunch of birds all all time. Huh. First turkey I ever shot was with a wooden silhouette decoy that my brother mm -hmm. John had just painted gray and dark spots here and there. And I shot my first turkey with that thing. I was kind of surprised. And silhouettes for geese are making a giant comeback. Oh, are they? Big time. It and it's space. Yep. You can put a hundred dozen of them in the back of my truck. And that may be my, okay, 100 dozen is not right, but. A lot. Yeah, it's, you can put, I could put 15, 20 dozen in the back seat of my truck. Wow, that's versus, amazing. Versus full bodies, that's like six of them. You need a trailer. Yeah, we, we do. Yeah, need for sure. <laughs> it's going to need to upgrade to a trailer here soon because toting them down the highway in the back of your truck with straps and praying that right. they all stay Don't there. lose any. Yeah, you know, and it's, you have. You go from market hunter days with tires. Now you're going to introduce silhouettes, which started out on the East Coast. Now you have full bodies. And those started as painted. I should have grabbed the one that I had. I have a couple of them in my truck just to show a progression. Um, the bodies are painted and the heads are flocked. It's a black, velvetish like material that mm -hmm. is sprinkled over the, the head of the decoy while it's, the paint is still wet. So it's painted black, and right. then they put black felt, basically felt, yep. on the head of it, and they call it flocking. What's the purpose of that? Eliminates the shine. Okay. It's more realistic. And then that, and then when, if it, if you do happen to be in r some sort of rain or fog or snow, it takes longer for the snow and, and snow to build up on the decoy. So now you have fully flocked decoys, the whole body's flocked, and then painted. Okay. Um and they're, they're just so much more realistic. And I, I think there's a few photos that I have of a decoy or there's actually, I think I sent one that has some of my decoys and birds landing into the decoys yeah, within feet of the decoys. Well, before we get into country music, uh, while we're still talking about duck hunting, I gave Danny a couple of shots the, and I, we mentioned them earlier. Danny, if you can, throw those on the screen, uh, maybe the one with the gal and her dog. This is just the coolest shot, and I know, Jeff, you'll appreciate this. I mean, you can almost see the reflection of the birds oh, in absolutely. their eyes. Is that ever cool? That's, that, that's what that's everybody... on the Mississippi uh, in the Driftless area in southeastern Minnesota. And isn't that just the coolest shot? I can't remember that gal's name, but her and her sisters all worked with us at the Quail Banquet down in Caledonia, and she showed me that. I said, you got to text me that picture, I said. And I'm glad that we could put it up there. Absolutely. When you, when you see a dog doing that, yeah. when you're out in the field, and the dog is watching the birds, if you're not paying attention, your dog will tell you yeah. that there's birds. Oh, yeah. All you got to do is look over, and your dog's doing this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good dog. Yeah, and I'm, I'd like to really hope that my wife and I's chocolate lab will someday be there, but at right now it's he's a one and a half year old chocolate lab that has no go and he's ninety five pounds. Jeez. Wow. And his his mom and dad are sixty and sixty five pounds. So Well you gotta get him up here to meet Ace. Yeah, Ace my is dog's, quite the bird dog. He just had a birthday and uh he's now eighty four years old. Dog 12. years, twelve years. He just turned twelve years and he's still in great shape and he's still a madman for pheasants. I have a feeling this is this coming fall would probably be his last. Um, 
because he's for he's hunting. Just, yeah, for for hunting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not yeah. in general. <laughs> no, we're not going to put him down or anything. <laughs> well, Danny, if you can throw up that other picture of um, look at this. That's this is Dave Miller. There it is. There's Dave Miller, his son Tommy Miller, and myself, and uh, that was all the geese we got in three days. Those are snow geese, right? Yeah. yeah. Snows are a different breed, and by different breed, you can go two different directions. That little tiny pea that rattles around in their head is so smart. Yeah. They're the dumbest smart birds you'll ever meet. They are. They're really Kind of like dumb. turkeys. Dumb smart. Yep. The other problem with the breed. I got a few friends like that. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Hi. Um, no, I'll, I'll own that one. I'll own that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Damn if you ain't the dumbest smart person I ever met. <laughs> right. You know a lot about a little and a little about a lot. Right. Um, but what... There, there's your tattoo. There, there's, there's the first one chalked up, 1998. What does the kanji say? That is live to hunt. That Beautiful. I had written up by my dad's sister, so my aunt. Don't do that again. My dad, my aunt Pam married a guy named Sinsook. He's Korean. Okay. His parents moved here, I think it was right around the time I was born, so 1980. They moved here. They have uh, it's 30 or 40 acres in Chippewa Falls um, out in Nowhereville. So they're, they're almost off-grid living to where their place is. So anyways, um, they are still 100% non-English. Wow. They stayed that remote hmm. this entire time and just never, they did what they needed to do to come here and what have you. They're amazing people. Food, you, there's no choice. You roll out of there or somebody puts you in a wheelbarrow to get you out because they stuff you yeah. all, th all day. And what nationality are they? Korean. Korean. Yep. I love and Korean food. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I wanted to add to that tattoo. Like, it is an American tradition. Yeah. But my uncle, being Korean, is part of my tradition because he's my family. Mm -hmm. So I, I told Sinsuk, I said, ask your mom, because <laughs> she doesn't understand it. She doesn't read it. She doesn't speak it. Wow. Ask your mom if she can write Live to Hunt for me. And she goes, he goes, okay. And it was a couple weeks later, he sends me a picture, and there it is. Like I, you got to add it to the tattoo? Yeah. Like it, it's that's part of my family. I'm not gonna avoid it, and I'm no, you shouldn't. I'm gonna celebrate it. I have kanji on my leg as well. So, um, yeah. I now I completely forgot what we were talking about. But you're, you're talking about snow geese yes. and the smartest dumb animal. So, breed. did he say he's got gonorrhea on his leg too? Kanji. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Kanji. <laughs> gonorrhea. <laughs> That'd be a weird place to get at Tom. I don't know. I was just ask. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a new spot. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, how'd that happen? <laughs> um. But they're, <laughs> but going, you know, as far as breed, they, snow geese are very extremely inbred. Okay. That explains a lot. So you get, I don't know if the word. They're mostly from Mississippi. <laughs> they might be. <laughs> uh, but for, for lack of My better words. My buddies in, get, in Georgia will appreciate that. <laughs> for the lack of better words, you get the best of both worlds. You get the smart and the dumb, and then they breed like crazy. And it doesn't matter if. It was their cousin yesterday and their sister tomorrow, and they don't. It, it's it sucks, but the what Tom was talking about too with um, they're eating, they eat the roots, and they will turn. If this table was five thousand acres, and it was green and lush and beautiful, yeah, within weeks it will look just like this table, yep. brown, just dirt. They're wow. eating. They're eating the tundra. Literally eating it up. You know, that makes sense because I was at a buddy's cabin and uh, and his dad's like, oh, hold on, I'll be right back. And he goes out with a firework and it was like a legal one. OK. And he <laughs> shot it out. Everything's like, legal. Right. Yeah. He shot it out towards the lake. And then I see these ducks run away or these geese or whatever. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't want them on my effing yard. And I was like, oh, OK. Because sure. yep. he's, he's trying to save his yard. Yeah. yeah they'll destroy up your grass. lawn and the goose poop. Mm hmm. Yep. But yeah, so that was a little tidbit about. That's cool. Snows. That's cool. And that's probably another reason why I don't chase them because they're so smart, but they're so dumb. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, you they don't want to be eating any inbred meat. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're, I mean, drain it up, make sticks. Yeah, there you go. Because then you get pork in there and then some. Some, some, some spicy pickles, jalapenos. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right. Well, when we come back from the break, we always like to uh, run into this new segment. TK, it's your segment. It's okay. called Tom's Tidbits. And last week when we did this, or was it two weeks ago? Last week? Was last week the episode or the um, recipe? I don't know. Yeah, so we're trying to alternate between doing a recipe and then doing some fun country oh. music specific stories. Yeah, last so, week we did the uh, pheasant recipe, the pheasant with the white wine sauce. Yes, and so this week we're into music, and Danny hand selected a couple of um, signed pictures that you have from all of your days in music, and uh, she will put that photo up on the the screen for the listening audience or viewing audience, and then I will give you this photo, and then we'll let you kind of share your thoughts about the photo Danny you ready yep. all right let's do it here's our first one. <laughs> oh, Charlie pride one of the nicest men in the whole world yeah I'd be happy to share a couple stories about Charlie pride um, his staff first of all absolutely worships him he's the kindest employer that he has staff that have been working for him from, from the 50s and 60s till today and they just think he's the greatest man in the world and uh, a kind soul. And uh, we had him at the We Fest once. And, uh, you know, when he sang Crystal Chandelier, I mean, the place went crazy. <laughs> um, I don't have any fun or crazy stories. All I can tell you about Charlie Pride is he's just a consummate professional one of the kindest, softest-spoken people you'll ever meet and never has a negative word to say about anybody. And uh, How come you only had him up there one time? Well, scheduling. I don't know. You know, it's just different scheduling. And, uh, you know, there, if I look through all the hundreds of pictures that I have, you know, there's probably several of the uh, classic artists that have only been there once. Yeah. And... Well, George, you said you only had one or two times, right? George Strait was there twice. Which is amazing to me because you'd think he'd be a guy you'd have like 20 times. He is expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. I could only He's imagine. Expensive. Uh, I mean, I can look at the pictures behind us and uh, Johnny Cash no, was there a couple times. We don't get to go there because we've got another one for you. Danny, oh, are you ready? Okay. Well, anyway, to finish with Charlie Pride, yeah. one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet, uh, just a good old boy, and uh, he's so humble and thankful that he had such a long fabulous career and uh, everybody everybody in the music industry loves charlie pride myself yeah. included so I've did you agreed. get this signed picture at the we fest that he was there yep yeah cool yep a lot of these some of these came from different shows and different this two tom cat charlie pride thanks all right what's you ready that? for the next one i guess so all right danny hit him with it George. The king. Oh. Well, another another great man. You know, I, I guess if I were to put all of the... Look how young he is in that picture. If I were to put all Doesn't of the... Doesn't look a whole lot like different. Like a stallion. Though. No, he does look amazing for his age. Because you guys are about the same age. We are the same age. And this picture is considerably older than that picture behind uh, Jeff's head there. And I don't know if you can see that in the shot. I don't think you no. can. And would you grab that quick for us? Yeah, just grab it. You're um, fine. But George Strait, go the, I mean, you, go this you way. know, what you see is what you get. <laughs> you know, whether it was the movie he was in, good. Pure Country. Pure Country. And, you know, well, I know he's your idol. He's my idol. And everyone else in the world, you know, loves country music. George Strait is the man. He's a big-time hunter has a huge ranch in Texas. Okay, that was that. See, he is considerably... Younger in this one, for sure. Yeah. I mean, but look, you at know, the, he's look at the baby face. <laughs> Great-looking man, you know? I mean, he's a he's a stud. He's a handsome mm -hmm. fella. He's a handsome feller. This one, you got a pick with it, too. Yeah, I got his guitar pick in that one, and uh, I ha actually have a few of his guitar picks. Um I got a thing in the house, a little jar that I keep guitar picks in, and it's pretty full. It's about like the size of this glass. Um, what can I tell you about George Strait? I mean, he doesn't get out on the stage and dance around like Garth Brooks does. Uh, he just stands there and does this thing, and everybody, the women just melt in front of him. And uh, uh, I 
I didn't have too much interaction with him, but the Emily's pointing at me. Yeah, I melt too. I mean, it's George. <laughs> well, I almost yeah. did too. Uh, the last time we had him at the Wee Fest, how could you not? He walked off the stage and he walked <sighs> directly to me, stuck his hand out and said, and knew my name. And I was like, a little blown away. He said, "Tomcat, I'd like, I'd like to come back." And I said, "Well, you don't have to twist my arm." <laughs> Right. We, we'll get you back soon enough. But then shortly thereafter, we sold the Wii Fest, and now we're back at it again. So uh, I, I look forward to the time when I can uh, say hello to him again. Just a legend. I mean, I put him right up there with uh, uh, Hank Williams Sr. Mm -hmm. and uh, all of the greats. I mean, Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers, you bet. I got a Kenny thing. I yeah, he got his tambourine. I do have his tambourine. I don't know if you knew that. He uh, mm -hmm. had surprised me in an episode and gave me yep. an autographed Kenny Rogers tambourine. Yeah, but George Strait, the king, the greatest. I hope he never dies. I hope he still c keeps putting out hit, uh, hit after hit after hit. All of us know most of the words to all of, almost all of his mm -hmm. songs. So, yeah, it was a real thrill to have him there twice. And, you know, that first one, I'd have to look at the poster behind you but he was really new. He wasn't even a headliner that year. What? That year that he was there in the post. George played the Wii Fest not as a headliner? The year he was there, and I'm sorry for looking away, but I'm looking at it the year he was there. It looks like it was in heaven in 87, if I'm not mistaken. And he was not a headliner. And uh, he was just coming uh, into the business. And, uh, you know, I like to reflect on... Uh, not the CMA, but the other country music award show. I get them confused. Uh, ACMs. Mm. The ACMs started giving away. The Academy of Country Music Awards. Right. Uh, they give away the artist of the decade. And it started in uh, the 60s with Marty Robbins. Oh, he yeah. He was the artist of the decade. You know, I mean, he had all these great hits. And then in the 70s, it was Loretta Lynn. The also known as the queen of country yeah. music. And then in the 80s, it was Alabama. Alabama. The 90s. Alabama, the first headliner of Wii Fest. Yep, yep. Uh, the 90s. Blake Anybody? must have been. No, the Garth. 90s. Me. Garth. Oh, okay. Garth. Well, I thought you said you couldn't get Garth to Wii Fest. No, I'm just saying the, they were the entertainers of that decade. Oh, sure. So Garth was, uh, and then George yeah, was the entertainer of the decade, two thousands, into two thousand, and then, I don't know if you could ever guess who the following entertainer of the decade was. Two thousand ten to two thousand twenty. Yeah, and I'm not gonna say anything negative about it because he's a great guy and he's a fellow hunter, and uh, I don't think uh, I could tell you, I could only tell you the name of one of his songs, and that's maybe because it was a time in my life when I was kind of getting away from country music. Uh, and right now, he's the entertainer of the decade, the last one voted, and I can't even tell you his name. What's the song? Um, the Road Anthem. Oh, Jason, Jason Aldean. Aldean. Jason Aldean. And Jason Aldean me, was the artist I of the decade? I have nothing negative to say about Jason Aldean. He's a wonderful guy. He had a lot of great music, but I didn't know. I mean, he beat out guys like... Uh, Kenny Chesney, Keith uh, Urban, Brad Keith Paisley, Urban, Brad Paisley, Alan Jackson, Blake, you know, all of these guys. And I don't quite know. And forgive me for saying this. I don't want to bad mouth anybody and I'm not bad mouthing him. I don't know how he beat out those other people. No. So that's there you interesting. Go. I agree with that. Yeah, that's interesting. Because <laughs> Jason did have that. some hits, but he didn't write much of his own music. Yeah. And uh, to become the entertainer of that decade, I'm like, really? Uh, above Kenny Chesney and Alan Jackson and Keith Urban. I don't know. Hmm. But whatever. That's just my opinion, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who think, you're damn right Jason Aldean should have been the entertainer of the decade. Hmm. And cool, cool, cool. <laughs> so there we go. You got George Strait. We got Charlie Pride and bad mouth uh, <laughs> or Jason <laughs> Aldean a little bit. <laughs> Not intentionally. So, Jeff, how did you get into country music? Because that's where we're at in the second half. That was um, more f more from my mom. Okay. Um, my dad is uh, old 
Aerosmith, early ACDC sure. type. Late and 70s, I, I, early yep, 80s. And I, and I will still blur it on my, in my truck or at Heck work. Yeah. I don't care. Right. Um, but the country thing started with, with my mom. And it <laughs> started off with uh, my mom having a new favorite at the time in Shania Twain. So it was like, huh, That's the, this is kind of fun, right? Yeah, she's very fun. So, you know, you're 11, 12 years old, whatever, listen, oh, Shania, this is, this is kind of, you get to bopping with I it. I love Shania just, Twain. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then it, you know, well, what else is there? Yeah. You know, obviously the radio is just playing and you start hearing the same songs over and over, not really over and over, but too often. Yeah. And then it was, oh, well, you should. We should we should get uh, this guy's CD. And I'm like, oh okay, and she bought a Garth CD, and I'm like, okay. It's about as entertaining now, as it gets. Now I know what music I'm listening to, and then it was, she'd buy this person and this person and that person, and actually, yeah, it was like right when the whole CD thing started. Um, but I did have some cassettes too, you know, that you were, I was listening to, and it it just kind of. It's stuck because there's, there's a story. I hear a story. I don't hear food in your mouth and <laughs> swear words every other word and right. stuff like that. So it's it it the way I was being raised, the music fit right in. Yeah, <clears throat> hunting, fishing, yeah, hunting every day. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great song, by the way. It's it great. is, and you you can't not somewhat somehow. Follow. That's a Luke Bryan tune, right? Yes. Okay. You know, Have you heard that one? I'm sorry. My mind's – once you started saying swear words and stuff, I th my mind went in a total different direction. My wife and I really enjoy going to movies, and there's really – at our local theater, there's not much out there, and they have the same stuff uh, like Silence 2 or whatever is or mm -hmm. I don't know what it's called exactly. A Quiet Place? A Quiet Place 2. Yeah, I haven't seen that one so yet. So we went and saw – the one with Samuel L. Jackson, who I'm like, every not, other word's an f bomb. <laughs> not a fan of. Um, There's parts so of me there that was, are a fan of him, but I like Sam Cap Jackson. Well, he taught all of our children the M. -er, <laughs> he did. You know? oh, yeah, so this movie, <laughs> I can't tell, <laughs> yes. tell you the name of the star of the movie. Uh, young guy, I can't think of his name, but Catherine Zeta Jones was in it. Okay. Everybody that was in it, we stayed there for like maybe ten or fifteen minutes, and we left. Because everyone was used because of Samuel L. Jackson, everything in the movie was mf'er. Yep. Mf'er this, MF -er. and the woman was doing it, and the person over here, everyone's mf'er. I'm like, all right, I've had enough. So we left, and uh, we got a comp ticket to come back and see a different movie. I said, it's, it was garbage. Were you yelling at the screen? You kiss your mom with that mouth. <laughs> No, but I tell you what, if I ever met him in person, I wouldn't have anything kind to say to him. Mm. Sure. No, I am sorry. And I'm maybe it's just because I'm getting a little bit older, but, you know, do all of our kids need to hear that? No. And need to emulate that? I mean, right. does a guy have any kids of his own? Oh, I'm sure. And Probably. is he going to? Some are here, some are And he doesn't, doesn't have any remorse or regret for teaching everybody to say mf -er. And I'm like, where did that phrase ever come from? It's like. Why would somebody even say that in the first place? I mean, mm -hmm. I was no saint when I was a kid by any means, but now that I'm a little older, I'm like, give me a break. I would, I would be willing to bet if he does have kids, they've some have gone over here, some have gone over there. They may be trying to separate a little bit and <laughs> whatnot because of that. There's a lot of people that that don't care for their parents' mouth, mm -hmm. yeah. and I, I, I'm far from innocent on the. Uh, on the clean mouth. Right, right. I, I have tr trucker's mouth and a sailor's dialect, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> not swearing right now through this whole thing. Got to write I'm, that one down. <laughs> I'm patting myself on the back because that's keeping Well, none of us clean, are saints, but, but, you know, enough's enough. Right. But yeah. Yeah, that was. So forgive me for uh, interrupting. Nope, and you're good. You, uh, you're good. You were talking about, I'm sure. So Garth. And hip hop. And, and snowball. They, Garth was the lock in. And then, you know, then it was, you know, you start, I think it was like an age thing for me, you know? Yeah. Mom introducing me into good music, hyper music, happy music, what have you. And then, you know, AJ, Diffie, you know, it just, 
here they come yeah. and it kind of kind of hooks you yes it does joe diffie was great yeah i loved him yeah. and then you he go, just passed away a couple years yeah. ago yeah and then you go out on a limb and at 19 20 years old whatever when it's 18 plus night at rodeo I'm going to take a trip down there. I'm going to see what this is all about. Rodeo Nightclub. We can go right to Rodeo. Yes. Well, Famous Rodeo <laughs> Nightclub. 1999. The biggest country music venue in the state of Minnesota, Rodeo Nightclub in Cottage Grove. And uh, and it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was a converted roller rink. Yep. Yes. Yep. And uh, they turned I, it into a nightclub. I thought I heard at one time that that, used to, that was a bowling alley as well. No. No, it wasn't? No. Okay. It, was, it was built as a roller rink. I know that because the company I worked with at the time was called Freedom Electronics, which eventually became Entertech. We did we did the sound system and the, the original roller rink. Okay, and I just the lights. I just had heard somebody saying that at one point prior to the roller rink that it was a bowling alley, and I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. But yeah, so it uh, in its heyday, um, you know, you, anyone that's listening or watching the podcast has probably been to a roller rink, you know, how we're talking about as far as floor space is concerned. Mm -hmm. And it would be literally packed with people out there line dancing. Mm -hmm. Yep. It would be. And including you. Huge. Including, including me, <laughs> including me. Um, but you, yeah, that, you know, it was, I went there and I, and there's an old picture of it. Yeah. That huge dance floor going there was when I initially met Mr. Travis. Yeah. Kid George. Yeah, because he was a, uh, I think, and well, we had him on for an episode. Yep. And he talked about basically that's where he cut his teeth in the DJ business. Yep. yep. I so. remember then it was rifling through milk crates of CDs to find a song. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that was those crates worth of CDs turned into these two because this is what we're going to play the most of. Yeah. You know, so they were able to narrow that down and then everything digitized and what have you. But the Hogs one. The Hogs was the uh, way out of my element when I turned 21. Oh, yeah. That was, I took myself out of my own shell, and I went again by myself and just went in there and went, hmm, this is, this is, okay, I'm, is this every Monday? A bunch like, of just, <laughs> bunch of boots and cowboy hats? Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking everybody standing there, like, is this like an every Monday thing? And then you start, you, I don't remember what, where you were in the where it was in the show um but i think it oh it was when i got there it was right before you started the um um drinking my baby goodbye and and the hank jr that, and uh, charlie daniel sequence yeah mm -hmm. and that's think, a good time to show up <laughs> yes yeah. it is <laughs> i think excuse me i think lasting the first, impression <laughs> i think the first person that i talked to and ended up virtually becoming friends with was Carson. Okay. So Jeff and Carson, aside from having very different or very similar looks, <laughs> same hairdos, um, they just were like known through the whole country, local country scene as these two guys that were incredible dancers. Oh yeah. So when Jeff and Carson would show up, everybody would be like, all right, you know, they're all waiting for them to go out on the dance floor and do some of the dances. Cause they would do, these normal dances that have been done at your show forever. Right, right. But they would add all these extra stuff in, like spins and crouches and kicks and jumps and all this craziness. So it was like, you know, I vaguely remember you doing that. Yeah. And that was, a, that was essentially sort of like the, what you guys did at the hog's breath was an extension of the rodeo renegades, right? Yeah. That was the baby version. So let's talk about rodeo renegades and how that got started and how you got involved with that. Uh, yeah. That, I basically watched, like I, I was borderline self-taught just by watching everybody doing these line dances at rodeo, yeah. the tush push. And it took months for me to get the cojones to go out there and let's see if my feet can do this. <laughs> my brain has it down pat. Yeah. Let's see if that goes here. Sure. My feet. <laughs> and, and then I, I did, I, I went out there and I screwed up a whole lot and I, I just kept doing it. Yeah. And then there was probably a year or two stretch where most everybody was excited when the Renegades would perform there because it was always something big. It was a dance team mm -hmm. from Rodeo. Right. And there was always some sort of big production. And it was 
five minutes of just nonstop wondering how their feet and legs and body are doing what they're doing. And then you get intrigued because now you're start now I'm starting to pick up the dances that I'm watching everybody else do. Yeah. Hmm. I'm kind of intrigued. Well, I started picking up on some of the some of the better dances. Rodeo nightclubs entrance. Yeah. Picking up some of the better dan the the dances that I liked that I'd watch them do and you'd watch the they'd perform and then they'd go out and dance the rest of the night to certain songs and whatever. So I'm watching them. I'm like, I think I can learn this. And apparently I did. Yeah. And then I think it was, uh, I don't remember if it was Chris Dumez or who it was had approached me about doing tryouts for the team. And I'm like, eh, nah, <laughs> that's not, that's not me. Oh, just, just come, just come. Okay. Give I it went, a whirl. I went and they're like, yeah, you, this sounds arrogant, but she was like, you, we just needed you to show up because you already had a spot. I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't happen to me. So I, right. Yes. Thanks. And then it's lots of practices learning all of their dances. And then you go, um, do multiple parades. We did a couple at the state fair, a lot of city parades, you know, whatnot, which is, that's interesting. You're walking the parade and stopping to dance, not a full set or anything like sure. that. Sure. Just a little sequence like or one two. Or, one or two walls and you're done. Yeah. You know, so you, you do half, a third of it. Sure. You know, and then you got to catch up <laughs> because you're stopping everything. Um, but it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. It, it, we, there was talk of doing competitions and then it just, the whole team just kind of fizzled out real fast. Huh. And I think it was just age and people started having kids and here we go. Oh yeah. Lower right. Knee brace and all. Boy, I recognize a bunch of faces in that photo. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. She look at your baby face, Jeff. Amazing. I bet if I. Which one is you? Bottom right. Bottom right. Down. The cowboy hat on. Yeah. No. Nope. No, no, in the ball cap. I see it. Yeah. Yep. Look at Beth Underwood and the baby face on her, too. Mm-hmm. Blast well, from that, the past, uh, man. That, that whole thing about women having kids is a real deal. You know, it's always going to happen, and it, sometimes it breaks up bands, and in your case, maybe – it helped to contribute to the demise of uh, your dance group, but yeah, you know they uh, have babies and uh, they have priorities. So right, well, and everybody, you have to live your life. Yeah, you're not you. You know, if you don't do the marriage and the kids things, because all I want to do is dance, and that that that's me. Well, that's not everybody else. Right. right. You know. So Britt Salvate was <laughs> on the Renegades for a while, wasn't she? Yep. Yeah, I remember that. Yep. Oh boy, I remember that one. That was, what was the country fest they used to have at Canterbury? Way early 2000s, mid-2000s. Boy, I don't know what that was called, but I know it Randy was, K1 was involved with Fan it. Jam? Yeah, Fan K102, Jam, that's, that's right. exactly what it is. That's, that's where that photo was. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was I mean, not very attractive of me. <laughs> but That's some pretty serious chest hair there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> uh, that day was so miserably hot <laughs> that you couldn't do anything to cool down. I remember that about Fan Jam. It was typically a time of year when it was just scorching hot. The whole Renegade thing was was a blessing. Yeah. Because it it led me to be able to go to do all these things. Dance at Fan Jam. You know, per perform at Fan Jam. Perform in all these parades and, mm -hmm. you know, make Tomcat upset with the line dancers on the... <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, that was an issue at the... Old Were you in this picture, Jeff? <laughs> no. I just found it online, and I wanted to tell you guys something funny about it. So this is the Rodeo Renegade um, jackets, um, and I have one. Which, I still do, too. Do you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, like, I've never uh, – the only time I went to Rodeo was on my Sweet 16 birthday. It was on a Sunday, and they stopped doing anything on Sundays. So yep. Travis was able to basically book it out for my Sweet 16. So that's my one Rodeo story because I'm just younger. But I found in Travis's things a, a Rodeo Renegade um, windbreaker, mm -hmm. and I just can't part with it because I'm like, this is so 90s. Mm -hmm. And it's so like the beginning of a lot of the relationships that I've got grandfathered into. And it's just, anyways, we, right. should, wear, we should wear them sometime, Jeff. I'll have to see if, 
I still have that or if my bride threw it away. <laughs> we went through my closet. That's day. fair. Yeah. That's fair. That's a rut row. It's a I su- found out sweet sm- jacket though. But it's still yeah. fit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But I also found a lot of shirts from when I was a lot thinner. <laughs> I was going to say when, you, when we say fit, where, can rough. you get it zipped up? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's still a 2X. Oh, nice. I'm still a 2X. Yeah. Last. Yeah. I'm still a 2X. So there was a big movement there for a minute, Tom. I don't know if you remember this whole thing because I want to ask you also about that connection with uh, Rodeo Nightclub, but Rodeo slash Rush, the Gold Rush. It was kind of mm-hmm. the same thing. Um, where. It got shut down mm-hmm. for some, we'll say, suspicious activity. Mm-hmm. And there was a movement. Brian, how do you pronounce his last name? Deku. Deku, yeah. De- yeah something. He was like really trying to get anybody in the way of investors on board to try to get it reopened. Mm-hmm. Because it had such a, you know, aside from your show, that was it, you know, mm-hmm. in, a, in the Twin City scene for, for line dancing specifically. Mm-hmm. Right, because right. Because a giant dance floor. a great place for line dancing. Yeah, I actually did a stint there with my show. Oh, cool! For I don't know a few months. A few months? Yeah. Why'd you pull the plug? I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> it, I was like, you'd think it would be a perfect fit. Yeah, I, I you know, I, re, I remember there was a lot of people there, and everyone was line dancing. Uh, I just don't remember why uh, I moved on, or, or what. It might have been because they were changing hands, and I think it closed down. I think they were getting somewhat close to maybe having some people lined up mm-hmm. to maybe buy it and revitalize it. And then there was like the roof fell in or something like there were some serious structural there was, issues. There was some big structural issues and, you know, that might problems. have been it. That might have been that's not, that rings a bell. That was a long time ago. My goodness. Yeah. Well, and after after rodeo went by the wayside, then Starks really picked up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Starks had Starks, Starks had has always thing. been there. Starks yep. have been there forever. I mean, that's like, I mean, forgive me to all those people that go there, Lynn and Dan and all those guys, but they are like psychotic about their line dancing. Oh, yeah. there. You yeah. have to, you have to have special shoes. You have to pay to go on the dance floor there. Right. It's five bucks to go on the dance floor. I went there and saw Charlie Daniels many, many, many years ago. I mean, in the seventies, I went and saw Charlie Daniels at Starks. And uh, there's a gal that lives right down the road that you guys might know. She was one of the line dance instructors. Uh, uh, her name is Annette. I couldn't tell you her last name. Short little blonde gal. And uh, she, uh, was, she was one of the dance instructors over at Starks. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, that place. Starks is still there, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Still playing, doing country music, I yep. assume. Yep. And that's yep. got a big dance floor, too. Day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Once you had alluded earlier about uh, me freaking out on the people doing line. It was tough to line dance at the Hog's Breath. Such a teeny, Still is. teeny dance <laughs> yeah. floor. And it, the line dancers kind of monopolized the dance floor. And I had all these college kids we can be that wanted to sometimes. get on the dance floor. And they were our bread and butter. And they wanted to bang heads and just do whatever mm-hmm. they do. And they couldn't get on the dance floor with the line dancers. So it was kind of a conflict of uh, interest there. And it was a tough deal. Well, I think and, we now, got, and go now, ahead, look, now looking back at that, I can see. Well, I was kind of a, a prick back then. <laughs> Don't sell yourself like, short. This You're still floor. a prick. I know. Touche. Ah! <laughs> Touche. Yeah. No. It's, Everybody gets a little here. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Dish it. Take it. Um, but yeah, no. Like looking back, it's wow. We really tried to take over that. Oops. Yeah, and it's just a little floor, and I, it was tough for me. Because I knew why we were so successful yep. for so many years. And then we all of a sudden had this invasion of line dancers. And I certainly welcomed them. Uh, I was glad that they were coming there. But it was, how do you tell how do them? You balance? How do you tell them, you know, you can't just monopolize the dance floor. And I did that and kind of tried to do that without of trying to offend them. Because yep. I certainly because I enjoy watching them too. But I didn't want to. Uh, piss off all of our regular clientele too. Right. Well, we've got a solution figured out because uh, Jeff, you may have seen online, but we have the 40th anniversary of Rowdy Cowboy oh, Show yeah. reunion party coming up. No, no, nothing about it. <laughs> I bet you don't. Uh, so, I was for like, the, really? <laughs> the listening and viewing audience, Saturday, July 31st at the Hogs Breath in Little Canada, we will be celebrating the 40th 
anniversary of the Rowdy Cowboys show, and we'll be leading that 9 p.m. party start with a 7 p.m. episode of this show, the Boots and Backstraps podcast. And uh, we'll, that entire 90-minute show with no break, we will be just rotating former DJs and MCs in the hot seat that have participated with Rowdy Cowboy Show over its history. And that'll be a very fun episode for that night and a great party as well. But I was going to say, we've created sort of a solution for people that want to come out and dance that night where we've gotten the, the club owner and manager to agree to take all of the tables, chairs, and surrounding bar stools for the back bar all off that floor for really? that night. I didn't know that. So that entire space, that entire span on that level will be completely open for dancing. I'd almost be more on board with a street dance. Yeah, can't do that with the noise ordinance. Right. That's but a problem just, that we have. Because people have said, you guys got to do a tent, and it's like, mm, and then it shuts off at 10 and o'clock. That, yeah. And don't forget, we're incorporating uh, the WeFest kickoff party as well. WeFest kickoff oh, party. We'll be giving away box seats, reserve seats, general admission tickets. Uh, Probably some apparel. Apparel, and uh, that's going to be a big part of the night. Nice. It's, you have the, like, the best of all three worlds that night, because you're going to be a co-host at the WeFest. Obviously, you're the originator, founder of um, Rowdy Cowboy Show. And then you're a co-host and founder of the Boots and Backstraps podcast. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to live up to all that. <laughs> well, I gonna, believe in you. Get to hold off on letting <laughs> you, you do this. shots until oh, at least 10. No kidding. <laughs> and then he'll be in bed by 11. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take care. Hey, Take I got, over. I got I'm out of here. I got a quick little uh, 4th of July thing I want to do with you three. Yeah, because um, it it's our 4th of July episode. It is. And then we got to wrap this thing up so bring the plane in for a landing exactly so first baller would Uh-oh. you rather have a hamburger or a hot dog hamburger shane picnic or barbecue barbecue <laughs> tom beach or pool well that's a tough one um pool pool okay i got a pool <laughs> come <laughs> on over grill. uh baller barbecue. parade barbecue. burgers or dogs parade or bike ride Huh? Like, would you rather watch a parade or go on a bike ride? Bike ride. Bike ride. Yeah. <laughs> Shane, the sparkler or Roman candle? <laughs> Roman candle all day, baby. <laughs> Tom, ribs or chicken? Oh, ribs. Ribs. Uh, baller. Was uh, she talking about your sex life when she said sparkler or Roman candle? None <laughs> of your Bottle rocket. <laughs> Ooh. Uh. Snake. Thank I you. was just going to say Snake. <laughs> Uh, baller potato salad or chips potato salad shane watermelon or baked beans is that a grower or shower thing (laughs) yes (laughs) watermelon or baked beans yeah gotta go beans and tom friends or family oh family family absolutely fourth of july this or that boom perfect well, everybody, well, we hope that hungry. you, uh, sorry? No, I'm hungry. Yeah, I know. Me you too. You know, before you uh, close this <laughs> off, I want to give you this because I have two of them and I don't need two of them. And uh, I know how, what a big fan of George Strait you are. And I also have a guitar pick that goes with this. Oh, thank you so very that much. Is yours. Thank you. Yours Appreciate that, my friend. Mint. That's fantastic. Yeah. Don't be Mint. jealous. I'm too late. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So we do, um, as Danny was saying a second ago, we want to wish everybody a very happy and wonderful Independence Day, celebrating the independence of our country from from England, from the English. And so uh, it's a a funny thing because there's been a bunch of videos online where people don't even really know what the 4th of July is all about. They're just like, oh, it's barbecues and fireworks. Like, what? No, it's it's a freedom. It's an independence thing. It's a lot of my <laughs> uncles and uh, cousins that died in a lot of wars so that we could have this freedom. 1776, baby. Yeah. All right. So everybody have a safe and happy fourth. Um, don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe to all of our channels wherever you're catching this audio or video version of the Boots and Backstraps podcast. And if you have questions, comments, or snide remarks, send those to bootsandbackstrapspodcast at gmail.com. TK. Hey, whether you're belting out your favorite country song or pursuing your favorite game animal, I encourage you to use that same passion to pursue the Lord. He will teach you to shoot straight. Thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Come on now. Honey's on looking for backstraps way deep in the woods. Tracking in a swamp to a hay field under the harvest moon. When the tags are filled, it's time to switch up our boots. 
head down to the honky tonk, get us a swing dance or two. We're talking about boots and back straps. 